This is the Amp Hour Podcast, recorded January 6th, 2014, episode 179 with guest Dr. Greg Charvat, Laboratory Literature Laureate. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Greg Charvat of uh, Butterfly Network, and I write things. Now. And he writes things, and he <laughs> breaks things, and he builds things, and he takes over for Aussies when they lazy asses and they go on vacation. <laughs> well, isn't he just sleeping in? Isn't it like three in the morning over there right now? No, no, this is when we usually record. It's like, it's oh, like okay. noon. He's sitting on a beach somewhere. He's... Lazy butthole. <laughs> yeah, but they, you know, don't they have to go north to go to the warm weather? Not south? Uh, that is true. Yes, that is true. And when you flush the toilet down there, it goes the other way, right? I learned that from The Simpsons, yeah. so uh, Yeah, me too. Is it true? I don't, I don't we know. Need a, we need a fact check on this flushing of the toilet <laughs> thing. <laughs> How are you doing, Greg? It's been a while, so if people don't remember you on what, show like 118 or something like that? I don't know. Yeah, we had, a good, we had a good time then. We were talking about all kinds of fun things. And then we That's went like, to Hamvention together. Yeah, and that was been a while ago now. That's almost like a year and a half. So we're on like one, I think this is 179 or 180. I forget what episode this is. But Oh my uh, gosh. So that's like almost that's like almost a, year, a little more than a year ago, I guess. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was. Yeah, in fact, uh, oh man, so much has happened in the past year. It's been crazy. It's been crazy. How about a little, uh, how about a little refresher on who the heck you are and what the heck you do? Okay, so um, I co-founded this uh, startup in Connecticut called uh, Butterfly Network, but I cannot talk about it. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm, well, that's all. That's the show, folks. So we'll, uh, uh, we're done. we'll see you let's, next week. Let's with cut the, it. Yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> well, I, I also wrote, uh, just recently completed the book, Small and Short Range Radar Systems. Um, Which we will talk about extensively. That'll be fun. And uh, I am editor of a, a book series on practical approaches to electrical engineering, which, which, by the way, I need to talk to your listeners about. We should bring that up later. Okay. I will need the help of your listeners on this one. Okay. Uh, I'm also uh, the advisor to, to MIT Media Lab, the camera culture group. We're working on some unusual radar stuff there. Um, I won, I don't know, I won some best, I won best paper at the Tri-Services Radar Sem- Sensing Symposium for my work on through wall radar, which is now, I found out recently, on the MIT Provost list of top university achievements for 2011, even though I never went there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, because you were an MSU grad, right? Yeah, and we just won the Rose Bowl. Uh, the I day, just, I, I was going to mention that, yeah, so I'm... Um... I saw you and uh, your uh, our mutual friend Scott, also another MSU grad, uh, you yeah. know, gloating about it on Facebook. That's oh man, fun. we have to. Yeah, maybe our last chance to do it anytime soon. So we gotta, you know, we gotta. You talk know, about that. you're listening. You're, you're talking about five thousand, five thousand electronics nerds right now. I'd say maybe five hundred care about football. That <laughs> well, might normally, be a stretch. Well, don't get me wrong. Usually, I don't care about it either. But then with the Rose Bowl, it's a big deal. That yeah, it kind of is a big deal. Some you of know, us do tune in for that. Yeah. Well, it's got the parade I, and everything, right? I mean, well, you know, the thing was, it was that last home run of the game that really sunk Stanford. Home run? <laughs> yeah, isn't that how it works? <laughs> <laughs> so then, the uh, in the third period, the uh, the uh, touchdown goalie. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, when they scored that free throw, I thought that was yeah, the end. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right off the bat. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's the sports the sports game thing. Yeah, the, the, ball the thing is, they the, got an offsides the and that's participants the free throw. in the the wicket. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, we should probably step away from sports. Uh, okay, <laughs> enough of that for now. We'll, we'll we'll talk more later about sports. Yeah. So so you've been doing a lot of stuff though. So it's last time you were we were talking about the uh, like you uh, the startup a little bit. You couldn't say much about that, but also your. Your course, your radar course, the uh, short course in January, right? Yeah, you know what? It's uh, coming up again. Actually, that course uh, is 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 going to happen again this June. So anyone is welcome to sign up. Go to MIT Professional Ed, and uh, we're having it again. That was the, oh cool. It was the top rated uh, MIT Professional Ed course in 2011. Huh? Is so that didn't happen in January this time? Because usually you said MIT has that month long break, right? Good. Well, that's a good question. It happens twice a year, so it happens in January for the students. It's free for the students, and then uh, oh, it, it happens okay. again in the summer for for professionals like you or 
or well, I mean, really, it's your your employer should pay for it. But any professional who wants to take it can take <laughs> that it. That expensive, huh? <laughs> it's it's thirty seven hundred a head. It's not cheap, Oof, but yeah, they, that is, they usually fill it with the waiting list. That's that's no contextual electronics type prices. That's that's much more. <laughs> oh, I would think you'd you know that's the I would think you'd charge more than that, Chris. I mean, come on, mm. you don't sell yourself short. I'm not. I'm selling myself access to wonderful people that should sign up now. That's true. Yeah, uh, <laughs> everyone should sign up. I've been blogging about that as well. Sign oh, up that's now right. for Chris's yeah. course. Yeah, you were very nice to write a blog. That's probably what you got you on the show today. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Do you think that might have something to do with it? <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> we should talk about Hamvention. So me and you, we were hanging out at Hamvention. That was great. I think I think me and Dave actually talked about it after the fact because uh, I heard I heard that episode is awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, uh, so it was me, you, Scott. Who else was there? Uh, we met. Uh, uh, oh. That Brad? one guy who builds Brad builds radio telescopes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we were uh, buying we were buying tonnage, man. That's right. Yeah. So yes, Greg was walking around the fair, talking about tonnage. That's all he cared about was big, heavy, nineteen forties, nineteen fifties radios that we said glow in the dark. Right. That was the other yeah, thing. yeah. The real radios glow glow in the dark, and they have big knobs and meters on them and stuff. Yeah. I mean, they shouldn't look like a pocket calculator. Let's just put it that way. Seriously, yeah. No, no. HTs, who needs those? Yeah. I, I don't even have one anymore. No? You got rid of yours? No, no way. I, well, you like spike really, it on the ground? You don't, you after, don't get rid uh, of HTs, you lose them in, in one of your moves. <laughs> they're they're just right. they're so small and they're gone. But yeah. uh, the big radios, it's hard to lose them. They're too big and heavy. <laughs> right. You, you basically, you tie your boat to them and your boat stays there too. And then you come back and get the radio and then you take it to your next location. Yeah, the, the military ones, the waterproof ones, they do work like that. They yeah. are waterproof. In fact, that's how that's one tactic they use to hide them from the enemy is they they dump no. them in the water. No, really? And no one no one ever finds them again. Is that yeah. is that for real though? I I can't tell. No, I'm just making that up. Oh, no. right? okay. That would have been sweet though, right? It would be like, cool. <laughs> yeah, maybe like a bathtub, you know? <laughs> no, seriously. What's what for real? This time I actually bought a military radio once that had directions in it about how to destroy it in case really? the enemy. Yeah. Because like, they were that they were worth that much or what? Not so much value. I think it's my guess is it's it's the enemy being able to tune into what you're doing and listen. I think that's probably the issue. Oh, if, like if, if you're using a guess. cipher or something like that, and it's got it like an encoder in there or something oh, yeah, like that. Oh yeah, this one didn't have an encoder. It's just I think just made it easier to listen. Would be my guess. It was a receiver and had these instructions about how, what to do. And oh my, it was crazy. It was built that's in the true, 50s, yeah. though. So yeah, I guess yeah. if it, if if the equipment's scarce, then uh, any kind of <laughs> if it's security by obscurity because no one has the tubes necessary to listen to a certain frequency, right. then you're... Yeah, or you, the money, you know. You can imagine yeah, how much right. these things cost back in the day. They're probably very expensive. Yeah, lugging around. And now them you pick them up for five bucks at the invention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or they pay you to take them away, like that old that scope we found. Did the guy t- pay someone? Well, he, he really wanted us to take it. Remember the scope without a screen? And we offered... Oh, Zero that's right. Because yeah. we figured he wouldn't take it. Because cause yeah, he, he did, was at 30. The guys, yeah. And we were at zero. So we were pretty far apart. I figured there's no way he would take our <laughs> offer, but he did. Right, right. And uh, we people should know Greg is a very shrewd uh, uh, negotiator. He got... So I think we talked about this after after we went to Hamvention as well, but that uh, the video you made with the, the R390, which is yeah. that... Uh, piece of gear why don't you tell why don't you tell everybody about that what what's what's been going on with that thing well it, for one thing it chris helped me drag it back to and i think we put it your the trunk of your car or scott's car somebody's scott's car. car yeah yeah well scott had like a nice audi a4 or something and we scratched the hell out of the trunk probably don't yeah. tell his wife though no well no. hopefully do you think she listens <laughs> I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say probably not. You know, it's a big, big world. There's other podcasts to listen to. Well, so we got this thing and then we threw it in Scott's truck and then we, or his car rather. He used to have a truck. We all had trucks back in the day, but now we, we have nice. He's got a nice, expensive <laughs> sports car. So he, had, we threw it in his car, scratched the trunk up, and then we drove to the um, the Staples and we had them UPS it back to my house. Yeah. And what I did was I, I I scheduled it so that my wife would be out of town when the radio arrived. <laughs> you know, life lessons here, everyone. Yeah, it's not just it's not just wives; it's partners in general. You know, if you if you have a different hobby than them, you need to schedule accordingly. You need to make sure they don't see it and they don't know how much it costs. Those two <laughs> things are important. Yeah, 
Right. You know, like your milling <laughs> machine equipment, Chris. What is that you tell your wife it costs what, fifty bucks? <sighs> it was forty nine ninety nine actually. It was That's it was on right. sale. Yeah. That's right. That's what you say. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this thing shows up at my house and it weighs it over seventy pounds. And uh I drag it in the house and I unpack it you know, in the doorway, and then all these peanuts go all over the floor. You know those little packing peanuts? <laughs> it's the evidence. You have to be careful. Those yeah. are the, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like cleaning up blood after a murder or something. At least as close as I'll ever get to that. Sta- oh. Static blood, right? Where it static. Sticks, sticks, sticks to your sweater. It sticks to everything. You can't clean it up. You know you're dead when she comes home. You know, and yeah. the best you could hope for is picking up little pieces, but sometimes there are so many, they're different size pieces. There are big yeah, ones right. and there's little ones and right. you're just... And then she yeah, holds she it up. She's it. like, did you get into the peanuts again? Who taught you this? I learned it yeah. from you. I learned it from you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Another yeah. thing you have to be careful for are cats, you know, because the cats might eat one of those peanuts and barf it up later. And she'll I, don't be like, have, Why is- I don't have a lot of love for cats, so, uh, you know. <laughs> Why is the cat coughing up a peanut? <laughs> <laughs> he, probably, he probably ordered some catnip, you know, he's... He learned it. It's that new. It's that new Chinese-made catnip. They they make it out of plastic now. <laughs> <laughs> but great, great deal on that catnip, though. <laughs> it, was, it was cheap. Came with a bag of uh, cat food at the store. They gave us this free Chinese cat. <laughs> didn't work. I tried that too. Didn't work. Yeah, she's too right. smart for that. That's good. Uh, so uh, yeah, so, that thing, so you got this the... thing in. Uh, I think people mm-hmm. might have seen it, but it's this huge. It was just a just a receiver. Is that right? Well, that's the problem is it's just a receiver, but we fixed that, though. We fixed that or you fixed that? I fixed that, yeah. Yeah. You, what, you, oh, that's right, you, so you did all this finagling, you, like, I'll put the uh, os- local oscillator or something like that through a something, something, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what you were doing. Well, the the thing is, like, I, well, so I uh, spent a day, got it fixed up and running, and it's such a cool receiver, I mean, you kind of, you just tune it for hours and hours and hours. But then after about three hours of this, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if I could transmit back to any to the people I'm hearing on this thing, you know? Wouldn't that be great? I mean, this that's what's missing is yeah. to be able to transmit with that radio. So I, that's what I did was I made it uh, transmit. And how I did it was I took um, the LO coming out of that thing is very strong. It's like a half watt. It just it's wow. it's really powerful. <laughs> <laughs> it glows in the dark, so right? There's, <laughs> there's plenty of power. Yeah. You know, you could probably just that alone you could transmit with just the LO alone. <laughs> yeah. This is all you need. Yeah, you could transmit but, to um, your send send a wife or send send a message to your wife across the house. <laughs> oh man, you could you could probably do uh, some QRP DXing with that tra- LO power. I mean, it was super powerful. Yeah. So I took that, I split it. I have all these mini circuits parts, you know, the coaxial parts. So I bolted together a little a little signal chain. I split split the LO in two, but I mixed it with uh, 8.455 megahertz, uh, amplified, filtered it, and fed it into the uh, the 5 megahertz VFO input to another radio I built, a 20-meter sideband radio, mm. which has the same frequency plan as any solid-state radio from the 70s, any solid-state ham transceiver. So I basically made a... a made the R390 act like a VFO, standard VFO. Yeah. So you could actually plug it into any radio from the 70s and, and have a R390 transceiver. <laughs> That's crazy. And it works. It's unbelievably cool. It's like the first time I, I made a contact with it, I was just... I'm like, wow, this is unbelievable. This is just, it's like, it's like walking on the moon for classic radio guys. I mean, it's, that's, it's huge. You mean so anyway. Walking on the moon? You mean dark side yeah. of the moon? Oh, on, on both sides. That's how great it was. <laughs> but anyway, it'll be in QST magazine in March. That, an art, a small oh, article. Oh, that's right. On that. You mentioned yeah. that. So what, what's, so, okay, so. I should mention that some of our uh, some of our listeners are not ham people, and it's pretty apparent that I'm not very much of a ham person mm-hmm. these days, even anyways. So, uh, so QST, That's okay. yeah, I know, but uh, QST we is forgive you is, is the magazine yeah, you're speaking on <laughs> on behalf of all the geezers out there. <laughs> I'm one of them. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just too young. That's my problem right now. So QST is the is the magazine. Um, yeah. So you got a little write up in there. What else? What else is usually in that magazine? Is it worth? Uh, is it worth our listeners picking that up and? And uh, is oh, it yeah, like subscription totally. based or what is it? Oh yeah, it's subscription. But um, if you if there's if there's an electronic shop near you, um, there aren't many these days. But no. if there's one, <laughs> they probably have it on the shelf. Mm. Okay. Okay. So um, there's there's an electronics place in um, Boston called You Do It, and it's like an old electronics type shop, but it's huge. And there's another one in Lansing, Michigan called Fulton's. Yeah. So every every you have those places every. In Detroit, there's one called Bell Electronics. Every now and then, you find one of these little shops. They'll yeah. have, 
They'll have like vacuum tubes, transistors. They'll have those gym oh, pack yeah. components. One of yeah. our former uh, sponsors, Electronic Surplus, is in Cleveland. That's that's how I found them to sponsor the show. But yeah, they got a, they got a shop too. But I don't, I'm not sure if I've ever seen any QSTs there. So, oh, yeah. But uh, there's a huge. There's actually a huge ham radio store uh, in uh, a little bit north of here, actually. In really, w- Wycliffe, Ohio. Yeah, it's oh, in cool. it's, it's in Euclid. I guess. I think it's actually Euclid proper, but. Uh, yeah, if you ever come through Cleveland, we'll have to go hang out there. I was, in fact, I just drove, I just drove through Cleveland. And you didn't um, call last week. I didn't you, call. You, you didn't even call, man. Oh. Well, we were trying to haul ass and get home. That was the problem. Oh, so. you went to Michigan for the holidays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We drove. I don't know what we were thinking, but we drove. Yeah, I mean, Midwest in winter, it's not like it's cold or snowy or dangerous or anything. Yeah, no, nothing like that. I mean, no. there's nothing like Snowmageddon. Yeah, right. <laughs> Aren't you guys on Snowmageddon Part Two right now? Uh, we're in cold. It's like it's like minus ten Fahrenheit outside right now. Wow. So uh, that's not very pleasant. I'm actually in my non-standard recording location because of that. Because um, the heat kicks on so much that I can't. Uh, you wouldn't be able to hear me right now because the heat would be on so high. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. Didn't you mention earlier you're at your mother-in-law's house? No, I, I'm borrowing her computer, actually. Oh, that's okay. the laptop I have. My laptop's in the shop, so I'm borrowing her laptop, and that's why I had to install our, our usual uh, setup onto this thing. So, uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's cold outside. <laughs> luckily, yeah, luckily, I have a Christmas ale right next to me to keep me warm, so I'm, I'm in oh, good shape. Man. Actually, I'm looking around here. I don't see one next to me right now. I should get one. Maybe we, I should, we, we could take a break if you need to. I can always edit no, out. A, I can edit right. out a break. I, I'll send a text message. See if my see if my wife might Ooh, give it for me. That would be great. You should turn she on that, that, that oscillator thing and uh, you know send a if message I across did the that, house. By the way, if I did that, she wouldn't. She she would slap me in the face or something. I'd get in trouble. Tell her you're like trouble. live on radio and you need you know that actually. So when Jack Gansel was on the show, he was our first guest. When he was on the show, he says, "Oh, hold on a second, guys." His wife walked into the room and handed him a martini. How? Mm-hmm. Really? awesome is that wow uh, that's like right out of the 60s man dude jack gansel uh actually jack uh I, I had a post on the subreddit this week uh so jack's newsletter came out today and one of my favorite newsletters uh it's called the embedded muse and uh so he was talking about he just got a 1946 Phil, philco oscilloscope and whoa yeah it is early <laughs> let's see if i can find it here uh did he get to work yeah it, i think he bought it working uh there what? it is yeah it uh it was it's like super it's like in one of those little two inch crt screens you know it's got it's got it's all tube based there's nothing to it yeah um but 100 100 kilocycle um nothing more than that there's actually no there's no like uh vertical readout on it so it's like it's definitely just for show <laughs> you know not for it's go. 100, 100 kilocycles yeah. uh, going downhill with the wind yeah exactly you know, right yeah that's what on, on a good day with the, uh, the wind at your back that's right you know you, you gotta like uh whistle pretty loud to see your audio in that thing <laughs> Yep. Yeah, so uh he he did a nice little write up of that thing. He actually got that uh I think just on eBay or something, but you know, we were you know, like you said with the radios before too, with like thinking about how expensive those were back in the day. Um, you know, for same thing with I, I can't even imagine buying a scope back in nineteen forty six, this little tiny thing. Oh man, that C R T tube alone would be very pricey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like all the phosphor process, processing and everything. I mean the C R T tube is, is- the was the key to radar technology initially that that was that was the the key piece because of the, because of the readout basically there's no other way to measure the speed of light otherwise it, it was well there are ways but it was difficult before then could you explain that a little more yeah yeah see the issue was you you want to see amplitude versus time mm-hmm. and there was no easy way to do that prior to the crt so it was it was a key enabler for radar technology in general and shortly after they came out that's when you uh that's when you could see the chain home radar defense system being set up in England in 1936. And, uh, there are others examples like that. They're all enabled by the CRT. Huh? That's really, that's a really cool piece of history. I, I, I didn't realize that's what was one of the key pieces. I just figured it would have been the like the, the, os- you know, like the actual, uh, you know, the, the tubes doing the, the oscillating and stuff like that. Oh no, no. They had those. I mean, in the thirties they had, uh, 
They had, you know, half a million watt uh, AM broadcast stations, all kinds of high power radio stuff. So what but, they were just uh, they were just kind of assuming assuming frequencies and assuming amplitudes and stuff like that. How do they actually I guess they were they doing it with like power meters and stuff like that. Is that is that how they're measuring oh, it before then? There are a few so you'd measure wavelength with a wave meter. So it'd be some a resonant circuit that was calibrated at a lab somewhere and you would tune in, you know, this is the wavelength for this, this is the wavelength for that, so on and so forth. Oh, and and you, you can measure power by light bulbs and you can measure power um, by heat going through um, low value resistors as well. Oh, interesting. But never, so that's how it was done. But never the actual amplitude, like a calibrated amplitude kind of thing. You wouldn't see the time domain signal. No, you don't need to. Huh. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. So it's like with a, it's like an average over time. Then right with a with a, a power meter and measuring yeah. heat that yeah. kind of thing. Like a light bulb or or some sort of resistor and seri- like they call it uh, RF current. Mm-hmm. They have a I forget what that's thermionic RF current meter. I believe is the term. It's, or it's like a th- it's like a thermistor it's, or, it's, or it's just a resistor in series that gets hot and you, you measure the temperature. It's one way of doing it. <laughs> Another way was the light bulb across the output. So you could take, um, you know, if you have a transformer coupled um, transmitter, the only way that light bulb is going to light up is if, is if you have a high frequency AC signal going across that, those coils. Hmm. And that's how they knew. That's how, that's how they would tune up the Titanic's transmitter was with a light bulb and really? a wave meter. Wow. Yeah. I read all about it. In fact, the Antique Wireless Association had a a big spread on the Titanic's transmitter um, in last year's uh, their their like annual journal that they issue. It's it's in color. Uh-huh. It's really amazing. This guy, this professor, you know, he I forget what university is that. He actually backwards engineered the whole setup and verified it with photos from the ROVs <coughs> that would dive on the site. It's really fascinating. That's really cool. So, you know, okay, yeah. so I hear about this stuff, right? Like, I, I'm, this is the first I'm hearing of all this stuff, honestly. Um, but like, how the hell did Tesla do his stuff then? That's that's what I want to know. Like, all of this advanced, you know, advanced transmitters, and or maybe they weren't that advanced. Maybe that's my my misperception. But like, how the how the hell did like Tesla do all his work then? They weren't that advanced for one thing. Okay. Um, he he spent a lot of time. You know, like a lot of those. So my I read a, a book recently called The Power Makers. I bought at the Smithsonian in Washington D.C. about a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. and it's it's a book on on how. Electricity was was uh, started was was spread throughout this country and the world and and just the technological innovations and and what happened the stories blah blah, so they talk a lot about Tesla. His biggest contribution was actually the induction motor. It yeah. wasn't AC. AC was around before him, so it's, his biggest contribution was the induction motor. And the reason why DC lasted so long is because the thing is to get motive power, they could make DC motors. They couldn't make induction motors until Tesla came along with his induction motor. Interesting. So that was his major contribution. And then once you could make motor motive power with AC, then the the then it was it was done. Everything's going to AC sooner or later. Yeah. But up until around 1920, there are still DC power substations because a lot of factories were still running on DC motors. Which is interesting. So you know, there's always talk about war currents dc ac stuff that's you know that's that is whatever it is right i mean that's yeah. that's a lot of politics as much as it is, as it is technology yes. yeah of course it did but uh, but what, what was interesting to me, i was looking at a block diagram today of a refrigerator and the interesting thing to me was today they, they're showing they were showing a dc bus and then an inverter in there to drive the compressor which mm-hmm. is kind of like the i've been working on ac induction motors a little bit as well but i didn't realize that that was moving into the consumer space as well you know and it's like you think about, you know, home appliances, stuff like that, right? So washing machines, mm-hmm. dr- you know, dryers, uh, white goods type stuff, refrigerators, that kind of thing. And you think, okay, it's just an AC motor, it's on or it's off kind of thing. But now it's actually shifting back in the other direction because then you can have power factor correction, you have all this other stuff based on these DC, these high voltage DC buses, and then you can have DC grids, DC storage inside of devices, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so that's actually the interesting swing back to DC that I'm interested in. I, I mean, the AC stuff is, has been around a long time for those white goods things, but I've seen it swing back to DC and that is actually what's really interesting to me. Yeah. Now that we have the efficient, high efficiency power conversion technology, you know, enabled yeah. by sal- high, you know, high performance MOSFETs and so on and so forth. Right. The DC right. transmission is suddenly an interesting option. We can send a extremely high voltage DC, you know, as far as you want, and uh, you'd probably you'd only have to worry about ohmic losses and and not so much you know transmission line issues and things like that anymore. So I don't know. I don't know too much about that stuff 
in this day and age. I just, I'm very familiar with it around the turn of the century from reading that book. <laughs> <laughs> right. All the important stuff, right? Right when I get started, not when it's, uh, yeah. So uh, that sounds like a cool book, though. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, The Power Makers. Look it up. It's a fascinating read. Well, I'll tell you what, it's great. Because that's the kind of read where it puts you to sleep after half a page. Okay. <laughs> and you soldier through it. It might take you 16 months to read that book. <laughs> <laughs> like it but did you're gonna sleep me. like a baby you're gonna have the best sleeps of your life <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know what you're expecting buying a book at the smithsonian i think you basically signed up for that as soon as the credit card transaction went through. <laughs> well, also, this is all the books i read are like that i love books i love history i don't read fiction anymore and i just but they all put me to sleep after half page it's like the best thing but then you keep going because it's cool like like reading about the titanic's radio room which i know yeah. way too much about that now that's, that, is, that is cool. I mean, that that's really fun. cool. But it yeah. put you to sleep, and then you wake back up and put your sleep. You know, just the best <laughs> thing. It's fascinating and good sleeps. That's good. That's Just good. like when people read my book someday, they'll be put to sleep. <laughs> so let's talk about your book. So uh, this has been, what, 18 months in the making? When, when did you finish this thing? Well, for those of you who need a good night's sleep, buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we should we should mention the code, too. So your publisher was nice enough to give a code for... Yeah. Uh, the book. What was the code? We should give that it's, now. Sh- it's AJM33. And for all of you hams out there, Alpha Juliet Motel 33. Nice. And uh, this is the code for the book, and you'll get uh, 20% off. Nice. And we'll yeah, repeat so that again to, at the end as go well. Go to the CRD website and search for it, or just Google small and short range radar systems. So how long did this book take? So first off, as the background, uh, ever since I've been starting Contextual Electronics, Greg has been telling me, no, 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 give up this online video crap and go write a book for 12 months. And I'm like, Greg, (laughs) get out of my face. I got videos to make. Uh, (laughs) I think I told you you could bang this out in 12 months. No problem. 12 months, yeah. It only took me six, so whatever. Yeah, Uh, you, you, You have all the content there. You I'm have not, it all. I'm not writing a book. I'm not writing a book about a software program, Greg. Uh, oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. No, How me, to use? Ki- oh, it changed. <laughs> How much? <laughs> three years. Three years. Three years. Oh, good lord, man! Well, here's how it went down. So I, um, I was serving on the phased array, the IEEE phased array symposium committee. They have this large international conference every seven years or so in 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 Boston, Massachusetts on phased array radar systems and so on and so forth. I was there um, on the committee, got to know a few people on the committee. One of them told me that uh, he's looking, his his um, niece is looking for authors. She works at CRC Press. So I told them, well, I've got this idea for a book I've wanted to write for years. And so they put, put me in touch and I got a uh, book contract in, in a matter of months. And so um, it started at Lincoln Laboratory and um, I wrote a little bit of it there and then I kind of, Got busy with other things like that course at MIT and the through wall radar stuff and all that stuff. And finally, we moved down to uh, Connecticut from Boston so that I could focus on the startup. I I got into these antique shops. They have these antique shops around here. We're, we're, we're in a coastal, southern coastal town. It's a vacation <laughs> a of, town. A lot of wasps. <laughs> a lot of, yeah, I guess that's true. And um, Them wasps love antiquing. <laughs> That's right. And if I'm into clocks and watches, so so do I. I love antiquing for clocks and watches. So I'm driving around to every single store asking for watches and wristwatches yeah. and buying them all up and then fixing them and you know, doing all you know, having a great time spending like an hour or so every day after work working therapeutic watch restoration time. Huh. So my wife goes, she tells me, you know, all that time you're spending on these watches, you could finish that book. <laughs> Translation, get off your ass, Greg. <laughs> your hobby is dumb. It's kind of hard to argue with that. Oh, that's, uh, you know, there there is something called leisure time, Greg's wife. Uh, <laughs> well, that's done. I have, I'm not doing that. There's no more leisure time for me. I'm, no? I'm past oh, that, man. unfortunately. But So I started working on the book, and the problem with the book is, as you know, is that it's it's very difficult to get the motivation to write a book, oh. and which you need to do is write it for yourself. That's right. And you, you know, have to have a habit, too. You have to be in like a, a groove where you have a, a regular time every day. You're going to go write a page or two. But it's not, it's not hard to get in the groove. I think what you want to do is you write for yourself. You outline it for yourself. It's, it's you're telling. 
it's your story you're telling about how you've learned to do things. That's why the publisher want the publisher wants you to write it because you're the expert. So mm. you got to look at it through that lens, and then you need to make it. You know, you need to have a vision, okay? And so I came up with this idea because I really I do like having things on YouTube. I do like podcasts. I like what I've done online and what you're doing online and what others uh, like you are doing online. So I want to, I wanted a sort of a holistic book where, you know, here we, we show people their goal is here's how you do it. Okay. Here's, here's how you do it. Here's the application. Here's some basic theory. Here's an example with that theory. And here's five case studies, you know, where each case study has a bill material shows you exactly how to put the radar together. And then here's oh, the from oh. each case study. I didn't and, realize you were doing like BOMs too. That's great, man. Yeah, full bombs. Every, for every radar in that book, there's a full bomb, schematics, block diagrams, software, everything. So now what is the likelihood that someone can afford the mini circuits that you're designing into these uh oh, into easy. these BOMs? Yeah. Easy. I mean, if you're if you're if you're at a, any company or you're at a lab or you're a grad student, grad students can pay for the stuff out of their own pocket. I mean, I did, so Okay. It's not it's easy. It doesn't cost much and uh the thing is, really, the, the, the other thing I wanted to mention was each experiment I show data in the book. But then uh-huh. you can go to the website and you can watch the YouTube where I pulled the data. You could watch me do the experiment for which you have data now. See, now you didn't tell me this when you were like, oh, go write a book. You're, you're talking, this is like some mixed media stuff here now. This, that's actually, that's really cool. That's well, it, it gets better, Chris. So you, you can okay. go to what you watch that YouTube. That's <laughs> Is there a hologram, the Greg? Are you going to be on my screen? Like you pop out like Tupac or whatever oh, his name no, was. There is, that, you know, there's synthetic <laughs> apps radar data. That's technically a hologram. Is um, it te- really? Is that technically yes, a hologram? Yes, you gonna, yes it is. You gonna, it wasn't Tupac. Who was it? Who was it? It was, uh, maybe it was Tupac. Whoever that hologram was. The uh, rapper. Uh, oh, really? Well, I, I, I'm a pretty. I don't really know my 1990s hip hop artists that well. Quite honestly, yeah, I'm, I'm obviously pretty. I'm obviously pretty pretty behind the times too. Uh, <laughs> I should I should remember this, but uh, yeah. I don't. Okay, so you get all this data, then what? So then you've so you, do I have you to download throw it in the MATLAB data then, or what? So you, you download the a little zip file associated with every YouTube video with every example in the book. Uh-huh. You download the zip, and the zip file file has the MATLAB in it. And has the so I need, data. I need MATLAB, right? So I need I need yeah. I need to have a two thousand uh, no, dollar. that's hundred. That's hundred bucks. Student version. It's cheap. Oh, okay. Student version. That's yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. So you get that, and uh, you know you or you can use Octave. The stuff will run Octave. Okay. Too. Yeah. I think with, yeah. I think the only difference is the plotting. Um, but uh, people tell me that my 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 MATLAB spaghetti code is running in Octave these days. I don't know. I've never tried it, but <laughs> so. Uh, my my code's pretty, you know. I'm I'm an electrical engineer. I'm not really right. Exactly. Person, you you so. build hardware. It's just yeah, that's what you yeah. tell them, and you, then right. you run away. <laughs> I run away and let them deal with it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so that's it is mixed media. So you get all of that with the book. That's very cool. I I like that. I like that model a lot. As long the key there is always, uh, how did you do the links in the book? Because that's almost always the problem. Yes, I told totally, you. So, so what I did was I tried to make it simple as possible because if I don't get it, no one's going to get it. So, how I did it was I had I made a WordPress um, website for the book that's very simple. It's off of my main web page, and uh, th- then in the book I cite the link. So each at the end of every chapter, there's a bibliography, and then I cite the um, web page and what where to click. So you you just have to look up at the end of the chapter. The, the the um thing you need to watch. So it'll say, you know, as shown in this video in citation five, and then you go to the end right. and look it up. So right, I right. couldn't think of a more elegant way to do it because I just I really think it's I don't want to put like w blah 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 right. blah in the text of a beautiful book that's written. Right, with exactly. Text. It, it looks like it looks like a blemish, right? It's well, like, it looks ghetto. It's just oh it looks yeah. too cheap, you know? Yep. So I put it in the the bibliography, but you could just go to the the website for the book and then each chapter is labeled and you click on that chapter, then mm-hmm. you can click on the different YouTube demos and download the zip files. Anyone can do it without even buying the book. So Nice. <laughs> so okay, so now I I grab this uh I grab this data off of there and I put it in the MATLAB and it shows so this is a syn- uh, the synthetic aperture, is that right? It could be the summer image. There's there's some there are some range range time plots. There are um, Doppler intensity plots, or there's a whole, there's a plurality of data, different huh. types of data, different types of data products from radar sensors of all types. Well, that's great. That, that's really great because then it's kind of like you can, it's like a choose your own adventure. You know, if you don't want to actually build the hardware, you can just go 
play with the data or you yeah, do that, all of it. Yeah. Well, that's it because a lot of people who are working on this may, you know, they might be signal processing people who will never build the right. radar. Right, um, exactly. And some people want to test the feasibility of something too, and they want to say, hey, well, what's this data look like? <laughs> hey, I want to find a mistake in Greg's setup. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's the thing. Is It's part of the theme of the book is that real data is ugly. And you will find when you do collect your own data that it has issues. Every system has their own issues. You have to deal yeah. with it. And you'll see yeah. issues in my stuff, and that's just the way these things are. Just from like... Uh just like small variations in the transmitter or, or what do you mean by that? Uh, I would say, you know, depending on what system is, let's say, let's say for example, it's one of the FMCW systems, you'll see transmit to receive coupling. So the, you always oh, hear your own transmitter right. all the time. Right. Even before, you mean before it actually goes out and bounces off something, you're saying it just kind of like couples around. It's just kind of the, um, yeah, like signal, signal bleed over. It's persistently there. Yeah. Because most of my radar devices discussed in the book are transmit and receive simultaneously. <laughs> Right, and so and sometimes they're built with stuff. coffee cans too, right? <laughs> yes, in fact, they are. We we discuss all the coffee can stuff there because it's such a great um, example. You know, you've got everything in the coffee can radar. You've got your yeah. RF, you got your antennas, you got your analog, you have your signal yep. processing, and you have your systems integration. Right, so it's all there. Which is another thing that's come up recently is that you had uh, the kit builder finally released the coffee can kit, right? Yeah, Quonset Microwave. If you Google them, they have uh, you could buy a coffee can radar kit. It's not cheap, but it's uh, so, yeah, it's like six hundred bucks, right? Yeah, but they're selling them all over the world now, um, yeah, because there's a great. demand for for the kit uh, in a nice little form. It plugs your into your computer with USB or it uses Bluetooth. Um, so we we uh, we have. I, I was receiving a lot of inquiry from people who just wanted to buy the kit, <clears throat> you know, pre-made. Right, right. Versus sourcing all the parts and the yeah. A lot of the, the different sub circuits and stuff well, the, like that. Well, the right? problem the parts go out, you know, obsolete so fast these days. It's ridiculous. Like the uh, waveform generator, the little that I used is gone now. The XR twenty two zero six, I think it's it's mm-hmm. no longer made. Huh. Pretty soon they're going to stop making the seven forty one op amp if we're not careful. I <laughs> highly doubt that. I really, I really highly doubt that. So wh- why does that? So so that does seem really fast. Is that just because process technologies are changing? quicker for rf stuff uh well this this is an rf part it's just a um a little analog part it's been around since the oh. 70s it's like a little analog um you know uh, multi it's a function generator it does you know square waves uh oh, triangular yeah. waves and sine waves yeah those things seem to disappear cause, especially because the ones i don't i don't know why it's like all the ones that people want that end up like dave talks about that that uh he has like a signal generator project he created that that uh ended up going obsolete same kind of thing so yeah i wonder if you use the same part i i, I couldn't tell you if i tried yeah That's, well i mean it's understandable i mean what you know i don't know what that thing's going to go into unless it's one of those korg synthesizers or something right it, well yeah exactly yeah Where, whereas it had all these uses back in the 70s it was going into yeah. a speaking spell or something like that no yeah, i'm pretty sure dark side of the moon was recorded with that thing there we go yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> So that's great, though. I mean, like, so so people buy this book, they get the discount, they can go build the circuits themselves. How? What is the level of it, though? Like, is it uh, is it like grad student level, or is it like uh, idiot Chris level? <laughs> oh yeah, Chris, you can handle it, no problem. Yeah. What about yeah, like beginner yeah. beginner? How 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 much do you need to to really get started? I would say it's beginner to grad student level. So it's 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 got a pretty wide spectrum. Some some of the topics a little theoretical especially the through all chapter uh-huh. um but uh it's got everything for everybody basically the goal is to take is, is to be able to show anyone including yourself or any of your listeners um mm-hmm. here, hint, hint. yeah, yeah <laughs> if, if you want if you if you're considering radar technology as a solution to some problem you're working on that you could do it with this huh. you could do it no problem it's very feasible so I've been seeing all these references to radar lately, um, and radar is a pretty broad term, right? I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's basically bounce a signal off something and collect the signal, right? Right. Uh, so one thing that's interesting to me is the application, and, and I think, um, you know, we, we've had uh, oh, I'm blanking on his name now. I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> talking about, uh, but like car systems having like radar built into cars now and maybe even when you yeah. were on we were talking about that kind of thing i mean yeah. that seems like a really big upcoming consumer level radar thing have yes. you seen any of that that kind of stuff going on or what, what's what's the deal with that the largest chapter in my book is on automotive radar oh really wow yeah. 80 it's 80 over 80 pages 
It's actually, wow. I didn't write it. Uh, two, the, the authors who wrote it, the only two chapter authors in my book, they're both from General Motors. Huh. These guys, I don't know if you know this or not, but you heard, you remember the DARPA Urban Challenge? Yeah, the the autonomous car that has to like, go through the desert or something like that? No, that it right? had to go through, well, oh, there urban. were two. Right. The first one was through the desert. The second one was through a city. Right, right, with, that's right. With other cars and all kinds of stuff running around. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, so the team that won that was General Motors and Carnegie Mellon. General Motors funded the team that won it. Wow. And so the, the these two guys are from that team who wrote that chapter. Yeah, that's that's crazy. So they know and, they know they know their shit. So you gotta, right, it's and, and a so really good chapter. So that's kind of the the same kind of. So I, I have seen a lot of this with the Google self driving car, just because I think that's better publicized stuff. Yeah. But a lot of it, you know, having that huge radar array on the top where it's all spinning around and stuff like that, doing detection of other other objects around it, that kind of thing. Yeah, you don't need that. You don't need that. Well, I'm yeah, I'm sure, but I mean, that's how I've seen it, right? I mean, that's sure. like I said, it's mostly about the publicized stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are what are we going to see in the next ten years for that? For it's like because you know you say okay, get into radar, right? That mm-hmm. that good claim by itself, but I think radar, I think airplanes, I think military. I think automotive is really interesting because it is such a huge sector and it's going to be so important. So right. tell tell all the listeners in the audience who are younger and thinking about getting into radar why they should because of automotive. Well, automotive, not just automotive, but anything, any sensor, anything that has a sensor that needs a sensor that can see through all weather, uh-huh. that can provide range in three dimensions, that can characterize targets through Doppler signature. Huh. That's what radar okay. does. Yeah. And so it's perfect for autom- automotive applications because you could put these things behind the plastic uh, fascia on the bumper and they shoot right through it. And if, yeah. you have a line, if you have some, some uh, salt on there from Snowmageddon 2014. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Or wait, for, for those of you in the Midwest, Snowmageddon 2. <laughs> What's it? Back for Blood? <laughs> or whatever they call it now. <laughs> whatever, yeah. You know, stupid weather channel. You know, I've been saying to my wife, I said, I said, the weather channel is like the popular girl trying to be like, look at me, I'm naming storms. Isn't this so great? Oh, this one's called Ion. This one's called that one. I'm like, shut up, weather channel. You're stupid. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> just an aside there. Yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> it's, it's more, you know, but here's the thing this ra- these little radars are meant for Snowmageddon. Because they can because see. Because they can just blast through everything. Right basically. through all There's the no... snowflakes. They can see through all the dirt and crap on your bumper, all the salt. No problem. Huh. And that's why it's, they're interesting. Is it because it's really high frequency too? Like what? what's the frequency range? Is this the, the two to five gig kind of thing? Some stuff is at uh, 24 gig. Other stuff is at 77 gigahertz. Oh, really? That high? <clears throat> Jesus. Yeah. But that's the thing crazy. is you can, you, can ra- you can gate out that obstruction that might be in front of you. And what it manifests itself is an attenuative loss, if anything. See, basically, it's because it's always there. You can just say, "Yo, this doesn't matter anymore." Yeah. That kind of thing. But when you're looking at the data, yeah, you could process out. They call that a persistent return, and we cover that in the book. When something is persistently there, it's easy mm-hmm. to coherently subtract it out from the data, huh? And show the real uh, targets, and you could play all those tricks with radar. It's a coherent. It's a phase coherent sensor. Hmm. That's fancy. You could do I anything, but here's the I'm still issue. not sure I completely grasp all this, Greg, but it's, it's okay. I'm oh, not going into radar it. anytime soon. So, I, I would say you don't have to go into radar, but I would say think of it, remember it as an option. You know, if you're, you're trying to solve a problem at the highest level and you need a sensor to do a certain task, and you're thinking about IR, you're thinking about LIDAR, you're thinking about acoustic, consider yeah. radar. Radar is doable. It's very doable. Okay. Yeah, so let's talk sensors because this is another thing that you mentioned before the show. This is the one of those startups you're working with. Let's th- let's hear about this startup. Sure. So I, I I advise startups for fun on occasion if if it's a cool enough project. And there's a startup uh, that I have been advising recently called Fiber. And what they do is they build a um, they build Fiber a, spelled f- spelled silly by the way F Y B R right F Y B R stupid startups. I know. <laughs> Sorry right? guys, if you're listening, I think. Every startup is this dumb. I mean, it's just like, come on, use your consonants. Use your words. <laughs> oh, it's a cool name. It's a cool name. No, it's terrible. It's not uh, a, no. It, this is like every <laughs> every time I look at like a demo day or something like that, it's like, where are all the E's? <laughs> something B-R, something G-R. It's like, just put an E in between the B and the R, right? I mean, like. <laughs> <laughs> Rant over. Say. 
Yeah, they're so they're so last year. Any marketing executive will tell you that. Yeah, right. They're so Who last year. Them? They're so 1995. <laughs> Exactly. They're so 2000 and late. But do you remember the company <laughs> E-Machines? Remember what happened to them? You That's don't right. want that E in your title. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's a death knell. It's a death letter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, boy. you remember what happened to Enron? That's right. That's another, another E. e. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This isn't just this ah, isn't a coincidence. Yes. It's a pattern. This is a real problem. That's right. That's why no one has the E anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, fiber. So, fiber. What, what does fiber do? So, these guys, they, um, they, I helped them to. Uh, they're having some trouble with a with a pretty advanced uh, technology that detects parked cars. So you may. <laughs> so it stays in one place, huh? <laughs> it does, and it may okay. sound. It, it believe me, it's it's when I looked into it, it's not easy to detect parked cars accurately to the point where. You know, you can navigate someone to an open spot. You can enforce parking rules. You can, you know, do all those things. It's extremely, it, it's tricky. And so they had so a So what's, what's, what's tricky about it, though? So I think about, like, you know, detecting a car. I think about those big inductive sensors they have at, like, stoplights where you pull yeah. up and, it, you know, it senses some, you know, huge metal objects above it. And it's like, okay, a car's here. I'll switch the light. So this is different, though. Well, the problem with that is you can't put one of those under every parking spot. It's too expensive. Right, you have to chop up the the asphalt everywhere. And yeah, you'd be screwed. Right? Yeah, and then the the you know, and the sensor itself is pretty expensive. They have wires going back to something else, and this this oh, right. system they developed is standalone. It's all battery and solar power. You you fire and forget. You deploy, and it goes for five years before it needs any maintenance. Huh. It's a really cool system. So these little sensors they go like actually into the concrete. Is that right? Yeah, or is they're it... like the size of a hockey puck, and they glue okay. concrete, and they just leave it there, and it goes for five years or more. So my main complaint about this is, am I never going to be able to park free anywhere in any city ever again? <laughs> is that is that is that going to be the problem? Well, you know, it depends on what city you're in. You know, okay. it, it really does. It's this yeah, is I one guess, of those. I, I guess if I'm driving to San Francisco, I'm asking for it anyways, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's where their stuff's deployed right now, San Francisco, yeah. and that's a high yeah. end. Everything's high end in San Francisco, including parking. So it's worth right. putting sensors in there like that. Right. Yeah, I was looking at that app you sent me. It said, it said like, it's like, and this space is $3 an hour. And I'm doing the math. Yep. I'm like, holy <laughs> crap. Actually, that's cheaper than Boston. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I parked for like 30 bucks near the convention center in Boston last time I was, was there. Was it a weekday like, or weekend? Uh, it might have been a weekday. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah Boston. Boston's insane, too. Yeah. yeah. Public transportation, people. That is a reason to go green right there. That's right. <laughs> for money. <laughs> for money purposes. Go green to yeah. keep the green in your pocket. That's right. There you go. That's yeah, what you that's do. A, but yeah, yeah, this thing is this is a really cool technology where they they will show you where these spots are. It's part of the um, Internet of Things, and it's Ooh. yeah. You like that buzzword? He dared. Drop? He dared to say that term. That's that's my job. I say that term <laughs> jokingly, <laughs> and Dave gets mad at me. The uh, Internet of Things. <laughs> yeah, but it's real, and there's a lot of a uh, lot of investors interested in making the Internet of Things happen. See now, I think this this is a really compelling thing. I, I was when you sent me this link today, and he was talking about parking stuff. I I, I started talking to my coworker about it, and we were kind of kind of uh, commiserating, like any kind of system where this is like automatically tied to money, mm -hmm. right? So say say you you know you walk into like a, a municipal building, right? right. You say. I want to sell you the system for a million dollars, but you're going to make two million dollars in three years. It's like you just it just sold itself, right? That's why these kind of systems right. are mm -hmm. easy, not easy to sell, but much easier to sell than it's like, well, your payback period is about 20 years and you might make your money back. You might not. It's like, no, here you're going to make this money on all those cars you already have a problem with and you're going to look good in the process. So that's that's why these kind of systems are really, really cool for that kind of thing. Yeah, they, It's an easy sell. Well, yeah, that's true. It's There's a lot, there's a huge demand for this. And the other part is it, it also helps the uh, citizens because it'll tell you exactly where the spots are. You can pull it up on your phone and just, you can navigate to a parking spot that's open. Which yeah. is huge. I so, wish I had that living in Boston because we, it was like, it was always super stressful trying to find a place in Boston. My wife, this is like, I'm surprised we ended up getting married after all the times we tried to find a parking spot in Boston. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Seinfeld episode or it's something. Worse than that. Actually, there was a Seinfeld episode where he just kept, he just kept circling the block or something yeah. like that. Or he, he had to move the car every two hours or something like that, but it was worth it. That's what it's like. It's exactly yeah. like that. It's in Boston, if not worse, especially when it's especially when it's snowmageddon. 
Of course. You're going to keep saying that word, aren't you? Snowmageddon. Yeah. All right. That's, that's right. If we get to 20, 20 saves, folks, everybody gets another 20% off the book. <laughs> Every time he says it, chug a beer. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, well, that, that's a cool thing. So what, what are the technical challenges there? Is it because, is it power? Is that the real thing? Because that's what I always think about with these like remote sensors is like the being able to transmit back. It was, you know, it was it, obviously it's not passive, but it was basically a, um, the technical challenge was the sensor itself. Um, okay. that was the big one that, that I contributed technically on and the, um, the, the sort of overriding technical challenge that that was, that's very well under control is the power consumption. So you have these pucks and they have their own batteries and they have to last for five years. They have to last as long as a wristwatch. Right. So yeah, they're like and, hermetically sealed and everything for the elements, right? Yeah. And they, these yeah. things are built really well. I mean, you could drive trucks over them. They've done it, and they do, oh, yeah. they do last. That's, and now, that's fun. The other thing is that you can't you know, send wires through the pavement and all that. These things, are it's all wireless. Right. And so that's the other thing I was going to say is it's got these big, uh, so, not solar, well, I guess they are solar powered, but they're like, they're like up on the light post, and they're, yeah. that's actually like the hub, right? That's right. And that's solar powered. It has a little cell phone in it, and it's got a little... Um, you know, tiny Linux box in there that draws very little current, and it has a special radio that talks to the pucks. They developed their own uh, proprietary radio comm system. Really? Yeah, it's all. So is that tough to do? Because like that, that's it has to still be in like the open spectrum, then, right? I mean, it has it to be is. within it is commercial but it's, spectrum. It's I would say it's similar to a lot of military radios where there it's impossible to track where it is. But they don't, security isn't really a problem, but it's... I was going to say, is that a problem? Like someone's no, going to go hack no. and save three bucks an hour or something? Not I mean. yeah, exactly. Spend 10 grand just to hack it. No, no. Yeah. That's not the concern. It's more of getting interfered with by other stations that might share the spectrum. Uh, so you want to, you know, spread yourself out. And they developed a very innovative way to do that. And they have ways of... And you don't want the pucks talking all the time because it draws the battery down. So yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they're all on a schedule together and they sync, they sync up and it's... See, now that's really a business within its, within itself. I went to this presentation on uh, Dust Networks from uh, the Linear Tech just bought, and it's the same. It's all heart based, which is like an industrial standard, but uh, it's the same kind of thing where it has like these scheduled frequency hopping, uh, you know, like so it's like, you know, it sends out like a heartbeat yeah. and it knows within certain time frames where which transmitters and. Well, I'll tell you, that standard was too power hungry for what these guys had to do. Wow. So they created their own from scratch. But that's a big it, undertaking. <laughs> it was. It was amazing yeah. that they. I can't believe they did it so fast. They they have a very strong team. Yeah. Um, well, that's so great. They, it's an incredible technology. The beauty of it is you can not only do the, the the parking sensors, you can also hang off hang other sensors off the network too. So you can have like environmental sensors to tell you the air quality in the city huh. at different by block. Nice. You, you think they're sens- going to open up the uh, the standard at all, or or is this going to be? The plan is, at least in the near term, is to um, provide open access to different data, different rates. So, like, the, the city might get the fast real-time access, but then, uh, you know, everyone else might get the, um, the sort of lower bandwidth, which is, low, which is cheaper for them to provide. Yeah. You right, know, it right. might be something like that initially, and then we're going to reach out to certain research partners at different universities who are interested in the Internet of Things to provide yeah. free data, high-bandwidth data feed, so... If anyone's interested in that, they can contact me, and I'll put them in touch with the right people. But yeah. yeah, we'll we'll hang all kinds of sensors off those. Yeah, you know, we're planning on you know trying whatever we can, whatever's interesting. You know, like like the Fukushima thing, for example. Yeah. You know, what if you had you had Geiger Mueller tubes on those things? You could track where the radiation is. I mean, you know what what if for well, they are doing that purposes? a little bit with the Safecast network, but that's not yeah. that's not low power by any standards. I think it's like you have to be you have to be on regular power. You know, that's right. kind of like distributed sensors and stuff. Well, this network, you can, let's say you make a, like you have an environmental catastrophe that just happened, you know, like Fukushima, and you have a bunch of pucks that you've made specially for such an occasion with Geiger Mueller Geiger counters on board. Then mm-hmm. you can deploy them all over the city and they'll provide you real time updates of what's going on. And these things are cheap, they're throwaway. So you just throw them out there and leave them. See, so, now that's, that's the killer thing, too. I mean, like, that's, that's what I always wonder about is these low power transmitters. That's, that's it's always cool the difficult stuff. thing. How, so, like, what's the range on something like that then? Because that's that's the other that's the other killer thing is like how many how many hubs you need in there, and then if they have to be meshed and all the interface stuff. Hubs don't have to be meshed. There's no mesh networking. That's why the okay. network. It's a very robust network. You know, their their accuracy yeah. on messages is you know in the ninety five to ninety nine percent health, depending on where they are. Right. Um, 
not a mesh because a mesh is kludgy. You kind of have to rely on everyone yeah. working, and it's meshes are not as reliable. As you right, and they're not as low power upgrades. either because then you have to talk to your neighbors as well as talking <laughs> yes. back to the yes the, the base station. So there's this thing called kiss in engineering. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, <laughs> and something if you something to that, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> adhere to that, and you come up with something simple and amazing like this. And yeah. basically, it's a it's a two way communication. The pucks listen and transmit. They only go to the gateway. And then the gateway oh, is a okay. little higher power. It's a big solar panel. It's got a higher power battery on it. And it goes right to the, the 4G cell phone network. Right. It's the same as, as a cell phone network, right? I mean, like, yeah. that's basically the same kind of idea. You know, cell phone cell phones are not super high power, but the towers are super high power. Right. And it's just scaled down from that then. And you only need, I think, one gateway um, every block or two or something like that. Huh. So that's you don't need that many of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Well, that's good. Yeah, so that's uh, a neat thing. It's neat. It's, you know, every now and then, you, you know, you... Like because of the book is because the book's coming out, I, I a lot of startups reach out to me about things, and every now and then I like to help them out with some advice, and this is one of them. And uh, these these guys really pulled it off. It's a great company, great team. So hopefully, watch out for them uh, this year. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about this. So so I, I had asked Mike Osman to be on at like last minute as well, mm-hmm. but he, he he couldn't he couldn't make it since I, I figured that I couldn't really talk RF, but he could. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but he mentioned this uh, NSA thing, and I'm not sure. I don't know what your clearance is if you're allowed to talk about this stuff. But uh, all of this stuff got leaked with all of the uh, all of the NSA stuff, mm-hmm. and there's some like insane insane. Uh, stuff in here. I don't, I don't know if you've, you've read any of this stuff at all. No, no, shoot. I, I, I've, I have to tell you, I've sort of ignored it a little bit. Well, but, I, uh, I had too, and and because it's like it's a lot of drama on top of. But like this, this was the really interesting thing to me was like this is like this is hardware. So what it basically is is the NSA has you know basically it like any company right. You have an internal, you have an internal part list of things that are available to you on an internal system right. In this case, mm-hmm. it's like bugs and. And there's something called Angry Neighbor, which What's is that? which is an, a radar based uh, way of bouncing signals back from. I guess you know you're going to put in some kind of uh, sensor to intercept communications, and then you're going to bounce it back to a a, a a central post like you're talking about with this this fiber thing. Obviously, <laughs> different applications, yeah. but uh, <laughs> yeah, no. you know a central hub, <laughs> and and then that bounces the 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 strengthening signal back to some central processing location. Okay. And so, but it's crazy though, because like, okay, so first off, I should mention that these are all in the public, right? I mean, so it mm-hmm. says top secret on all these things, but basically I asked on Twitter and they said, oh, yeah, if you don't have clearance and then you can look at top secret stuff and because you're not restricted from looking at it, which sounds mm-hmm. counterintuitive, but I was a little worried. But the crazy thing is like, these are tiny, tiny little devices. Like, so one goes on the... uh the ferrite in your monitor cable and it harvests the red signal from your VGA mm-hmm. and then it bounces that to some central unit <laughs> and That's then cool. that bounces it and you can like, w- they can like watch. I mean like aside from all the political stuff, because I really don't care about that ide- either. Like this mm-hmm. is just cool technology. I don't know yeah, if you saw, neat. saw that. Let me send you this link real quick through the mumble. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, that's that's interesting. So they probably needed the I don't know anything about that stuff either, but they probably needed the intermediate link. So you have a super low power thing on your monitor cable. Yeah, right. Exactly. Then, yeah, it's, it's, it's built into the cable, right? And it squeaks out a little teeny signal. It probably doesn't even you know, last too long, and then it squeaks out the little signal over, and then you've got something sitting in the bushes outside that pulls it up and then blasts it onto whoever knows what else. So that makes sense. I mean. Yeah, and I mean these transmitters are like super tiny. I think they're showing they're showing like, I think it's like twenty mils or something. I mean like it it looks like a, a SOT twenty three dash six kind of part, and like that takes up most of the board here. What is, so, what I mean, wavelength is it? Do you know what frequency it is? I can't really tell, but it's so it's it says the angry neighbor is a family of radar retro reflectors. Hmm. What does that mean? <laughs> well, that just means um, that it. Uh... It's a radar reflector that refl- you, know, you bounce a signal off of it. And it reflects the same direct. It reflects back at you no matter where you are, no matter what the angle of instance is. Oh, really? So retro okay. means it goes right back at you. Okay, so basically it's like a catch-all for all these little tiny signals. It's like a, it's like a bike reflector. 
you know, as a retro reflector on your bike. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, like, that's oh, that's the where I know the term from. It's what Jerry yeah. always talks about with her uh, cast star thing. The, the screen is a retro reflector she talks about. Yeah, I don't know what it is in context of this. This doesn't sound like a retro reflector to me, but I don't know. Yeah, well, pfft. But yeah, so, so basically, yeah, and so like, I mean, like, like I said, the politics, is, it, it is what it is, but like the technology, I mean, this is a lot of money and interesting research yeah, that yeah, went into maybe, this. I bet that chip might even be an ASIC probably or something. Something. I mean, so, okay, here's one. This is called the Rage Master. Mm-hmm. It's an RF retro reflector that produces an enhanced radar cross-section for vagrant collection. Vagrant being some... Uh, uh, acronym. I don't know what that is. It's uh-huh. concealed inside a standard computer video a VGA cable between the video card and monitor. It typically installed in a ferrite on the cable. It provides a target for RF flooding and uh, easier collection of the vagrant video signal. Yada yada yada. It was found that man, and it's just like it's just like there's this catalog of all these things you can go and buy them, and they have prices. That's the crazy thing about it. Like it's like it's like hey, I need like two Rage Masters and one how much? Gotham. How much is it? It's thirty bucks. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, exactly. Some of it's like thirty grand, but that little thing is like thirty bucks for a little oh, tiny. Oh, wow, that's throwaway. That's cool, man. Yeah. So there's that's like cool. there's like a a whole yeah there's a whole mess here. But so basically, when I talked to Mike, he said, "Yeah, ask ask Greg what he knows about this thing." Obviously, you, you hadn't heard about it, so that's okay. But uh, no, no. But there's like just tons of stuff here. I mean, like tons of like interesting. RF and, and and you know it's it basically it's going back to base station and it's encoded and then it goes back to their super secret servers yada 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 um, and I'm sure if Dave was here he'd be raging about that stuff but luckily yeah he is he is on vacation <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's called it's called Angry Neighbor though that is oh, that is the man. program and there's like a whole so this is I sent I sent you a, a link to a, a, a WordPress page that one of our listeners posted when I, I but there's a zip file where you can download the actual PDF catalog it's oh my just, gosh it's just so that's, crazy you know, to that me. stuff like it's too bad that guy, i mean that's uh there's that's important equipment it's too bad it uh got leaked like that i mean i can understand yeah, I the mean, political things but that you know man geez yeah yeah i mean yeah it is what it is right it's it both both <laughs> you know the people who don't like privacy and the people who do like privacy yeah. are both mad about it right but uh at the same time like if you're just looking at it from the technical perspective, it's crazy. Oh, oh here's my another gosh. one, Surly Spawn. It has the capability to gather keystrokes without requiring any software running on the targeting system. Basically, you plug this thing. I don't think you even have to plug it. I think it just harvests the PS2 signals wow. off the keyboard line. And then basically it sends that back. Yeah, but who, and has, got a little tiny, who has a PS2 keyboard I, I was thinking that, oh, it says USB and PS2. Who, and, who's got a USB one? You wireless now. Oh, they wouldn't that's even. Need that's that even thing. easier, right? I mean, you just intercept that. They're using like unencrypted 900 megahertz signal. Like I know my keyboard is is super crappy. You know, it's just using right. some 900 megahertz radio in there, um, and that's really easy. And so basically, just has a little square wave oscillator, and it it just detects what the character is, and it mod- modulates the frequency, and then some other bigger system picks it up and takes it and runs with it. Man, that's crazy. That's kind of cool, actually. I almost think like. Uh... <laughs> It'd be interesting working on that stuff, wouldn't it? Though, man, it would. Yeah, and so you know, I've talked to some people in the past who talked about that. You know, they that like had tried out for the NSA. You know, yeah. they, they had because they, they have huge recruiting too. Yes, and and I always wondered when they talked about you know all they I went through all these tribulations, trials and tribulations for the NSA mm-hmm. um, jobs, and I'm like, well, what the hell do they work on? And now I know. <laughs> now we all know, right? I mean, like, this right. is this is it. They're spending a lot of money on this kind of thing because this stuff is small i mean they have their own chip fabs and everything like that so that's like right out of uh james bond man exactly you need like q to pop out and like what? give you like do they have any exploding, like exploding pen. pens yeah exactly that's the <laughs> that's the key thing yeah you gotta have the exploding pen I don't, do you see that in the catalog <laughs> it's not there it's not there this must be the this is the american version you have to get the british version for the uh yeah. the exploding pen so oh man uh, that's awesome no i don't really i'm not familiar with that stuff at all it's fascinating to hear about it though wow man <laughs> so another question so i had mentioned on twitter that you were you were coming on here and um uh who was it asked about it it was scott harris he asked about the nav spacer shutdown uh did you ever use that thing oh you know yeah 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 so that's that's a space uh looking radar that's the space fence as it's called it, that i learned from wikipedia it's not though <laughs> they're they're making a new one 
Um, ah, I was going to ask you that. Okay. Yeah. So the, the this one is um, it's a 220. I think it's 17 megahertz, and you could um, you could actually point a, a ham radio Yagi at 220 at in the direction of this thing. It's in Texas somewhere, like Lake. I'm gonna. I, I will screw up the name. I think it's Lake Hickapoo or something like that in Texas. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's the name was something on that order. Let's just put it that way. And it, it was in Texas, and the transmitter was there, and there there were site a couple other sites nearby, yeah, and there were sites right. in uh, a couple other locations. And Kickapoo, yeah, you're right, Lake Kickapoo. Yeah. I was right. Gila Gila River, Arizona, Jordan Lake, Alabama. Yep. Tatnall. The transmitter is at Lake Kickapoo. It's it's huge. It's CW. What is what does it say for the power in that? You know. Uh, do power. Let's see. It's it's a megawatt or a couple megawatts continuous. Six seven hundred sixty eight kilowatts. Okay, <laughs> it's almost a megawatt, and it's on. Yeah. It's just on all the time. And if you point so, your hand so at it, you could hear it. You could hear satellites zipping by. So basically, this thing just spews signal into space. Yes. Is that the idea? And then whatever bounces off comes back in a fan beam. And then anything that crosses the fan beam scatters back to Earth. And then the receive stations would uh, geolocate the scatterers. Because there's more than one that could say, I'm here, that's what I got here, I'm here, that's what I got, that yeah, kind of thing? Yeah, because you know where your receive stations are, and the receive stations are large arrays of antennas that give you angle-angle. Yeah. So each one gives huh. you angle-angle, then you got the time, and then yeah. you know if when it crosses the fan beam, you know geographically where the fan beam is and how it projects into space, so you could... Oh, man. And you also know Newtonian physics, you could back out the orbit. That's right. And that's, that's why, crazy. That's why they have that thing there. It's a nice... It's Science. Run, it yeah. works, folks. <laughs> it's run by the Navy. It's run by the Navy. It's a, Air Force, it says. Oh, yeah. Well, they, Air Force, I, yeah. Initially, it's the Navy. They must have handed over, you know... I'm just reading off point. Wikipedia, so don't don't listen to anything I say. So. No, that's okay. Was, I think it was the Navy at first, and then it, it, it was first built a long time ago. What, the 60s or 50s or... Well, the thing that was interesting to me about this was the, the resolution it has. is something like four feet... Yeah. So, no, so, was it four feet? It was something very, very small. Well, you know, it's probably target dependent. If the target's really big, it's four feet. If it's smaller, it's probably not as good because they're they're oh. doing angle, angle, you know, angle estimation with received beams, and you know, that right. depends on the target strength. So right, and probably then, on a good well, day, like the going, jitter of your oscillator or something like that too. Oh, or? they'll have they probably had top of best oscillators in the world on that thing. Yeah. So that wasn't a problem. It was probably more like. Um, target RC at radar cross section of the target, how big it is for the radar. Huh. So the okay. bigger it is, the more precise you'll have, you know, you more precise information you'll have on a positional information with a system like that. Huh. Just cause it's more stuff to bounce signal off. Yeah. Of, more like stuff bounces back. It's probability. So what you, you know, depending on what the receive size, I'm not familiar with what they, what they look like, but let's assume that they're a monopulse sort of configuration where you effectively have four sub arrays. And then you, what you do is you look at the amplitude and phase difference between the four arrays up, down, uh-huh. left, right, and you can resolve the target to high precision. So the higher, but the higher the SNR is, the more you can split the beam. So if it's got a really good SNR, like 20 dB SNR, you can split mm-hmm. the beam of one of those arrays by a factor of 100. So let's say the beam width is, you know, one of your subarrays on your receive site is, you know, 10 degrees. Well, you can get one degree beam width, uh, or you can get 0.1, 100 mil degree resolution if you have a high enough SNR on target. So wow. that'd be my guess as to the generally how it worked, but... There's probably some people out there who worked on it probably know more than I do. So then, like, the angle that you can calculate, basically, then that's just about how how high up it is. Like, if it was further away, it it, it uh, you don't have as much resolution then because of, like, the... Was that the arc length or something like that? Well, no, your resolution should be good, but then the amplitude would be lower. And you, you, you're you always... Something like that, you're balancing the scattered amplitude with the uh, resolution you're able to achieve off of the system. Okay. Oh, uh, here it is. Okay, I finally found it. It says it can detect objects as small as 10 centimeters or 4 inches. It heights up to 30 kilometers or 15,000 nautical miles. Cool. So that's just detection. It's not positional. It's just, it's there. Yeah, yeah. Basically. And then position's okay. a different thing altogether. Yeah, I see. But I they see. could position it too. You know, wow. it's, I really like that system because it was so simple and elegant and, you know. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> it's just spewing energy into space, yeah. right? That helps. <laughs> well, I mean, Our- when I, I, my thought on that was, you know, maybe you... You consider uh, an upgrade, perhaps. You you modulate it, and then you improve the receive sites. I think with digital uh, radio receivers these days, you can so you get like a lot sweep of through frequencies or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like or maybe have... you change it to chirps, and then maybe you make yeah. you, you put D-Rexes on all the uh, receive sites. They may already have that, but you know, I really like legacy equipment like that. You could do a lot with old legacy gear that we have in our country. So yeah. I love working on legacy stuff. Yeah. 
At Lincoln Lab, you, we did a lot of work with legacy equipment. It was fun. That is cool. Yeah. I, you, what, do you like retrofit it though, or is it just? Yes. Do you like the power of it, or what, what do you like about you it? You retrofit it because the thing is, a big giant vacuum tube transmitter doesn't change. Right. I mean, yeah. There's still AM, AM and FM towers that are using big vacuum tubes, yeah. right? Yeah, but you know, like radar microwave, a, a million watt radar transmitter is going to be the same. <laughs> oh my god! If yeah. in the 1950s as it is today, there's no change. So <laughs> hopefully, there's better safety regulations. Yeah. So what? You know, you get the <laughs> You're wind not melting knocked. chocolate in your pockets, right? You know what they used to say back then? <laughs> ah, you touched the B plus line, you got the wind knocked out of them. It'll be our <laughs> shake it off, shake it off. Back then, they were men. <laughs> they were men. That's right. Men, men were men. <laughs> Women were glad of it. <laughs> <laughs> No, but like when I, when I was at Lincoln Laboratory, we had this Millstone Hill radar that I, I worked on that several times. And um, it was it's a key piece of equipment. It was built in the 50s because we were expecting satellites, orbital satellites in the mid-50s. So they started building the thing that Sputnik was launched, and they had to accelerate the job and finish it in a week. So they still really? use that radar. Yeah. It's, What's it's it called? Millstone so Lincoln Hill. Lab, Millstone Hill. Radar. Look okay. it up. It's L-band. It's uh, 1,200 megahertz. And it's uh, a couple, you know, it's... Mass of power. The transmitter's yeah. the same. Yeah, it's crazy. But you, you know, you 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 give it upgrades. You know, the antenna's the same. But then, you know, that thing's got vacuum tubes in it. It's got you know d- digital receivers. Got everything. So do these have to switch out the tubes often or no? I mean, like, do those things start to degrade or? Are yeah, they much, yeah. Tube, you know, tubes tubes do degrade after the a while. Cathode or something. Or I'm not sure what the failure mode is usually on them. But there were a lot of tubes in the modulator circuitry because it modulated. They modulate a big. Um, uh, Klystron uh, amplifier yeah, oh, tubes. Oh right, right. And so you had to you had to gate those things on and off, and the bias voltages were really high, but you had to swing them in microseconds. So you need these giant, you need those huge tubes like the four dash four hundred A's or something yeah. like that that you have in a ham. You know, it looks like half, a bell jar, right? Yeah, it looks like a bell jar. <laughs> so we had those, and then we had to then you have to have some other thing tube that drives that, and so you're yeah. stuck using tubes all over the place, which is fine. You know, right? Well, you you like that anyways, right? Yeah, I mean, it still works, but not too. Your, your moniker don't use online it. is Mister Vacuum Tube, of course. Oh right? yeah, well you know, why not? Got to got to do it. It wasn't gotta taken. <laughs> I was wondering. I was wondering about that. Why didn't you choose Doctor Vacuum Tube? Were you were you still Mister Vacuum Tube at that point? No, no. Why didn't you I was, upgrade to Doctor Vacuum? I thought tube? It, I thought I could have been Doctor Vacuum Tube, but I thought it sounded too presumptuous. <laughs> <laughs> what like, if there was another? Joke? That's right, yeah, but and then and then you got to fight to be the one, right? I mean, yeah. you gotta, there there can only be one. I figured Mr. Vacuum, vacuum Tube was better. You know, it's a little <laughs> lower key, a little nicer. Doctor well, Vacuum Tube is my father. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Doctor oh, Vacuum Tube dri- you know, drives a Buick, comes That's by, right, does yeah. house calls, Just chill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I prefer Doctor Vacuum Tube to be like that, the father from that movie, American Pie. Oh yeah, the Eugene Levy. Yeah, <laughs> with the with the huge eyebrows, the big and the, eyebrows, oh, the funny right. voice. Well, yeah, son, I yeah. want to talk to you about something. That's right. Yeah. That'd be oh, Doctor oh, Vacuum yeah. Tube. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Vacuum Tube, played by Eugene Levy. <laughs> you know that guy drives a Buick. He's got oh, one. definitely. Yeah, but you know what? He's probably like rich or something. Yeah, yeah. you know. That's because he's an actor. He's not actually Dr. Vacuum Tube. <laughs> <laughs> we just like to make things up here. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah we do. Uh, so what else have you got going on? You've got, you got a lot of crap going on. When it, how about this? You're not allowed to say anything about Butterfly. Where, how close are we to hearing? How, when are we actually going to have you back on to talk about Butterfly? Oh, my gosh. Hopefully, uh, well, you know, you're not going to believe me if I say a year from now because that's what I said last time. <laughs> that is true. You did say that last time, you liar. <laughs> so I don't know. Hopefully um, in a year or so, what we're doing is taking a lot of time. and uh, it must yeah, mean it's good. It's good. It's good. It's All very right. complicated, extremely challenging, but a lot of fun. And uh, we're learning a lot. And uh, Good. Good. You know, it's, I'm starting. I'm at year three now, Butterfly. It's my third year there. Wow. That's a long haul for a startup, you know. That's a lot of ramen, I got to say. <laughs> that's a lot of ramen. It is. That's no, actually, so they feed us quite well there. So it's, no, that's yeah. good. I love ramen, by the way. I had ramen for lunch today. You did? Oh, man. Yeah. I dress that stuff up. It's it's not a, it, I don't know what these startup guys are talking about. Oh, dude, I put like, I put a egg. I put uh, spinach, mushrooms, really? scallon, scallions, scallions, sesame oil, sriracha, Soy oh, sauce. That stuff. Oh, I got, I got all the good stuff. 
I, I throw out the little packet. I, I put in my own chicken base for like chicken. I put in I put in real meat. Wow! So you spend like an hour making ramen. I yeah, I, I spend quite a while. It's it's worth it. It's delicious. Man, it's uh, it's good. Oh man, <laughs> goes down easy. It does. <laughs> All that for ten cent noodles. I know, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> put like ten dollars in groceries into your ten cent noodle broth. That's right. Yeah, I do basically. That's awesome. So one of the one of the thing. Uh, so Andrew back or was, or was back or back on uh, Twitter, uh, ninety six hundred on Twitter. Um, he was asking about this RTL SDR. These little the dongles. Um, yeah. Apparently, someone has turned them into a. I don't think it was phased array. What? Did it, clicking, clicking, clicking. It is uh, passive radar, dual coherent channel RTL SDRs. Was it you, uh, Vernon? I don't. I don't know Vernon? what you're talking. Find out who did it. Who? Who's the name on that? It was a Finnish guy because I yes, remember. I said, yes, he's writing yeah. the first book in my book series. You are, yes, that's right. Yeah. You are Vernon, yes. Oh yeah, now try and say the the, the imaging receiver where where he works, the Kilpis Jarvi. <laughs> Kilpis Jarvi atmospheric imaging receiver array. <laughs> yeah, that's him. Yeah? That's cool. So the, so what what that is this thing? Awesome. He's a friend of mine and uh he he's really into software to find um radar and very few people have actually done this actually i have never seen a software defined radar done right yet until i've seen his work so i saw his work what's difficult about it because i would think that would be i mean like there's so much dsp going on in radars these days in there i mean like it's timing it's synchronization it's how do you synchronize your transmitter with the software defined uh radio they're meant for streaming applications oh because they're not because they have to actually crunch on them this is what we always talk about like using processors using using fpgas and fpgas you're streaming the data through right versus an sf software thing you have to crunch on it right so it's not deterministic we want we need we need something deterministic we need the timing to be exactly right right exactly and so he, okay he's figured out how to do it what about it is it just is it is it slow it down is that the answer well <laughs> in his case what he does he uses multiple radios and one of them is a reference receiver so he ah. actually doesn't even need to be plugged into the transmitter he has one antenna point at the transmitter then one point up into space where he's listening and then he gets a direct path to the transmitter then he, <laughs> he records and cross correlates it with what he receives from his scatter antenna so he's using a metronome. That's basically that's yeah, basically that's the answer. It. It's, it's a pretty very sophisticated metronome, but it costs nothing because he uses these these yeah these, these sixteen dollar dongles. Yeah, these things. Have you ever used one of those? They're, they're no, pretty fun. no. But they're he showed weird. me these at the Phased Array Symposium in Walt in uh, Boston this past uh, fall. I was there you, and uh, you'd love spent them, some man. Time together. They're they're twenty bucks on Amazon. They're super cheap. You should get one, and you could just you could just point. I mean, obviously my antenna is crap because I don't do much antenna stuff, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you just plug it in. It's got a little tiny, tiny. Actually, when I was at Hamvention, I was looking for the that crazy connector. It was uh, Scott was helping me find some. I forget what it was even called, but it was some tiny little. Oh, it's like a reverse SMA that they put on it or something. It was or... an SMA. It was some other smaller thing, like a not an N, but something small. SMB. No, not SMB. It was like a something with an M, hmm. like a multi letter. I don't remember, but oh, okay. Anywho, uh, yeah. So you can, or I could be completely wrong. It might just be SMA. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, these little radios, I mean, they're amazing. I mean, what they're what they're putting on there. You know, it's, there's nothing to them, so. Well, well there's read, material read Yuha's wise. book. Read his book. It's coming out. How do, how do you say it? Yuha? Yuha Vernon. With a G, though. Yuha. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and it's his book or it's your book? It's his book. But you said he's writing something for your book as well? well no, no. I, I'm, an, I'm the editor of a book series now. Oh, so what, what the heck is that? What's the book series? Oh, this that, is great. So I, I developed a pretty good relationship with CRC Press, and they've offered a book series to me where I basically I look for talent for authors to write books uh, on practical up to electrical engineering. And so we were talking at the Phase Ray Symposium uh, this this past fall, and he was telling me, I've got this idea. I want to write this book, blah, blah, blah. And so told, this is why you've been bugging me, huh? This is yeah, like editor, I want Greg. You to join. Okay. I'm, my go, my job is to find talent, and you've got talent. I I've got I've got a, a, a cadre of five thousand listeners who might might be interested. So you, maybe we should set up a special email oh, address or a, a, let's let's throw that out there a right for, now. A form or something. What do you what do you? How should we do this? They can just email me. So if any of your listeners have an interesting book like you Oz, or. Uh, would want to write Chris's book for him. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great, actually. 
you know, just email me directly, and I'm looking for people who are passionate and want to write something. It's 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 a it's a fun time. It's a great experience. It's not. Uh, it's 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 like it's like learning to drink Guinness for the first time. <laughs> See, this now, is you, said Chris. The, you said this before. I think you're full of crap though, because Guinness <laughs> is delicious, and you're you're, you're I, I don't understand what you're saying. Well, okay, so when I tried Guinness for the first time, the first one went down rough. Yeah, you're doing it wrong. The second one was a little rough, and the and after that, they're great, and I love That's them. That's how every since. beer goes, Greg. I mean, you could be drinking <laughs> height beer in Korea like I did, and it's, yeah, the first two stink. The third one is right. Is, smooth <laughs> and the and the and the eighth one is just one that's right exactly the eighth one you <laughs> probably should have like, stopped at six <laughs> you probably should have stopped at six. but that's what it's like writing a book you probably should have stopped at chapter six <laughs> and so but you know it, it is a fun experience and really you know if if you have an interesting unique idea and you want to share your knowledge with the world let me know and, and send me an email it's uh charbot g at gmail.com and i don't know it's probably in the show notes or something do we have show notes? oh yeah good yeah on our so new you, beautiful I mean, site that no one likes uh yeah. i love it i think the site's cool man there we go we got one you hear that folks we got one person who likes our site one a that's right those who disagree say nay oh i none. don't hear, I don't hear anything either Crick. that's yeah, it's, it's weird it's almost like yeah. it's almost like it's just us in here <laughs> <laughs> uh, no but seriously email okay if you, you're interested in writing a book and uh let's just talk you know if you have an interesting idea you want to bounce it off you want to just talk about it uh it's okay and there's no rush on these things books take years to write and <laughs> well, it could be something you follow up with with me five years from now that's fine that's, too these things take their long-term projects, so you're not doing so. sales for uh butterfly networks are you you're not like eh, it might take like five years or something <laughs> you know what you get it when <laughs> <No>. you get it <laughs> <laughs> no. that, but at butterfly we have got to work really really fast that's what we do it's good breakneck yeah. speed anyone who's you know done the startup thing can tell yeah. you it's just breakneck speed all the time that's why going on year three is is an achievement if you make right. it right that, that means people really believe in what you're doing that's that's a good sign yes that's and, and good no investors one, too. people aren't running right good investors who are, are uh, work with you it's yeah. great it's really great so i'm going to send you one link so we should close out here with this uh this is i found this through uh alexis magical who's like an editor at the atlantic he sends out this thing called yeah. five intriguing things it's like an email that comes out daily and i poach a lot of links for for the amp hour so i'm sharing my secret here folks but uh he he, he posted and i think he found it from someone else it's a bunch of qsl cards from 1956 and they are just from all over the world. And if people don't know what QSL cards are, basically you make a contact in ham radio and then you send you someone sends you a card, you send them a card. I think I got that right, right, Craig? Yeah. And Yeah, that's right. It's like uh you're 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 like a pen pal except over the Right, air. yeah. It's like it's like a marker that you've made these contacts too, because then you collect them. And you can show them off to your right, friends. Right, exactly. And then, so they're actually collectibles. And so these are some guy took pictures of all of them. And he's got them from just all over the world. They're all really old wow. and awesome. There's one from Radio Australia. You know, they're, they're like pieces of art, basically. And uh, just really cool. I highly recommend looking through these. I don't, I, do you still do QSL cards? Do you have your own QSL card? I um, probably should. But basically what I do is I fix old radios and build old radios and put them on the air, make a few contacts, and then build another one. Ah, right, right, right. So it's not just about the, the contacts. It's also about the... Yeah. But then in the meantime, you make some pretty badass contacts. Like, I, for whatever reason, when I prepared, when I made that R390, trans with R390 thing mm-hmm. video, I was getting into into Russia, like really middle Russia, Eastern Europe, just consistently every single day. <laughs> See, now that matters. That That's, that's also like the... Uh, not stratosphere what is it the ionosphere is that ionosphere right? yeah yeah someone took the ham test a couple months ago <laughs> oh <laughs> right. man it's fun isn't it i guess i I don't know i don't have time for that man See, but the, the repairing seems like the fun part if, if anything i think that would be the fun part i mean i know there's well, hams there's, listening so don't get me wrong there's a big uh radio community out there for for glow in the dark radios you know the real ones that don't look like pocket calculators that's right yeah there's a community out there. It revolves around this magazine, Electric Radio Magazine. Okay. And it's just, it's this guy, this guy, Ray, and he, like, he writes, he puts together in his house, and, it, you know, just people send in articles, and it's my favorite magazine, so. Okay, I'll have to check that out. It's cool. A lot of, yeah, lot of like, rebuilds and stuff like that, all your. 
all it is is rebuilds all antique it's all vacuum tube stuff and military stuff and people write about what they did and yeah. how things blew up in their face and they nice. have to, like some people are really good at write they write a wrap a pretty good story together it's it's a lot of fun so that's awesome i don't know that's where they are that's where all the uh, the vintage radio guys are kind of around that magazine that's awesome so since you're a radio guy i'll ask you since you're a ham guy isn't there a thing guys like guys and gals that's right guys, guys and gals yeah. uh um isn't there a thing with like uh, people sometimes use like test music or something like that, like like license free test music or something to test out, or is it always just voice? It's always you. You can't send music. It's always voice. Well, that's what it's I mean because it's not licensed, right? I mean, like I wanted to know like if there's some way to get the amp hour on as like test as test signal. Me and Dave oh. yapping as test signal. You know what? Yes. Yeah? Here's how you can do it. Okay. okay, I got a plan. There's this there's this shortwave station in Maine, okay. um, and I forget the name of it. But they basically will let anyone buy airtime on their station. Oh, I don't want to buy airtime. <laughs> but it'd be so cool if you guys were on shortwave. You'd be you know it'd be awesome. That would be kind of fun. I bet I bet there's some once. whacked out stuff on that station too. I bet there's some some very yes. strong opinions on that station. I bet that there makes me and Dave look like opinions. kittens compared to uh, the tigers that are on that station. Well, you'd based be surprised. There are more than just tigers. This one was cool. So, so I, I restored an old radio, shortwave radio, and I was tuning around. And I heard the Twilight Zone theme song. Really coming through oh. the shortwave. <laughs> That's perfect, right? <laughs> and I thought this is going to be good. You know, I can't wait to hear the political yeah. bloviation that is sure to ensue. So I kept. <laughs> listening and yeah. instead this guy comes on and says you're in the you know vintage music zone for the next two hours i'm going to be playing nothing but surfer music uninterrupted oh and that's all he did was like dick dale <laughs> and the delphins and surfer music <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was so awesome man that's awesome it was great and that's the station i forget what their callers are but they're in maine and you can uh submit your uh files and they'll broadcast them it can't be that expensive Chris. it can't be maybe we can set up a collection we'll all throw a couple bucks in yeah yeah there to we get go. you on shortwave for the first time ever <laughs> amp hour premiere on shortwave that's right exactly and, and, we, know, we can have a launch the, party imagine <laughs> the flyers for that you can tell your friends okay attention amp hour fans Warm up your bomb shelters because <laughs> we're going to be Get out your wave. can of beans. <laughs> Hide under your desk. Fire up those Geiger counters. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, or, you know, just download the podcast and you'll be fine. <laughs> or, yeah, but that's no fun. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, don't have to throw, you, don't have to, you don't have to throw up a big antenna in the tree to, to download a podcast, you know. That's no that's, fun. What's the, what's the fun in that? It's not about fun. It's about convenience and... <laughs> sharing <laughs> uh, that's right and you can also say clean you can you you, you clean your guns too that's our part of uh, it oh but that's that's a definitely that's a thing to do <laughs> at least stateside right that's right because <laughs> amp hours coming over shortwave <laughs> yep you know keep your neighbors out of your bomb shelter because they're going to want to come in there and listen to that's amp right with yeah you, <laughs> you got to protect it <laughs> that's right <laughs> uh, oh man all right well we should probably uh you know cut off this laugh fest but it's been uh, it's been good to have you back on man I, I look forward to having you back on in a year and hearing yeah. your excuse about uh, butterfly networks well i look forward to seeing the uh, draft uh table of contents for your book oh well yeah of course that'll be as soon as we as soon as we get a volunteer <laughs> submitted by potentially one of your That's listeners right. ghostwriters yep exactly but uh yeah oh wait you know what i want to throw one more thing out there Okay. So, a couple ideas I'm throwing out there to your listeners on interesting books that would be good for a series. Okay. One, a book on how to maintain, repair, and run legacy equipment, including vacuum tubes, old transistor stuff. Okay. Kind of like the old radar stuff we were talking about today, like, yeah, like the NAVSPUR. So, if anyone has experience in, in, in that field, email me if they're interested in writing a book, because I think that would be a very valuable book. Uh, That's two, basically like trying to capture the graybeard wisdom, right? Per, yes. The graybeard wisdom wisdom you know how do you how do you maintain <laughs> are you old... a gray beard yeah. you should call greg please tell us how you you know have a few stories about some some stuff you've maintained and that i think that'd be very valuable because i tell you while i was at lincoln lab you know we would actually bring back the gray beards from retirement to tell us how they designed some circuit or some yeah, assembly right. and and that's and so common it's very common and so a book on this sort of thing this sort of equipment would be extremely valuable i'm trying to find author to do that okay. two we're looking for a book on uh, modern approaches to FPGA design. 
you know everything oh, from board level. There's got tons of that stuff. There right? is, but I want I want a special one. I want a very practical approach. I want the kind of book that I would pick up and read. So <laughs> on FPGAs, yeah. I mean, this is the problem. Which is there, not one there's, yet. That's tough. That is. T- I I would I would look for that too. But uh, well, there actually challenge. there was a talk. There was a talk at uh, KS uh, Communication Congress, which just happened out in Europe. There was a. Uh, I wanted to call that out too. There was a FPGA 101. And granted, that's beginner stuff, but. It was a good talk, so people should check that out too. Yeah, well, if anyone a beginner sort of book, so just throw it out there. If anyone's interested, that'd be a really good one for the series. So, okay. you know, stuff like you know things like that, uh, or anything you think of as listeners, shoot shoot okay. me a note. You no know? others? Do you know any others? Um, there's a few coming uh, down the pike. I can't really mention them right now, but uh, okay. there's some good ones coming. So, okay, yeah, well, stay we'll, tuned we'll definitely keep people updated on those. We'll be yeah. the. Uh, and of course, Chris's line. book. Chris, Chris needs to do his. So send oh, yeah. emails what's, to Chris directly. Tell him to do what's it. The, what's my book going to be, Greg? I don't. I don't think I have one in mind. There'll be something. You could. You yeah. can. You, you're a good. You're a very good communicator. You can communicate the basic principles of electronics. You know, show people soon how to I, really do it. As soon as I look them up on Wikipedia, of course I can. Right. <laughs> you can say Chris's uh, guide to Wikipedia. That's right. Yeah. How and how to two turn. Pages. Wikipedia into semi knowledge for There's fun like and profit. There's like a that that yeah. says fun and profit Wikipedia semi knowledge. And the next is thank my wife for putting up with me for all these years. And That's the right. Third page yep. is www.wikipedia.org. <laughs> e, it's en.wikipedia.org. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, man. Well, it's good to have you on. Good talking we'll, to you again. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. All right. See you at Dayton this year. All right. Bye. <laughs> Take care and bye. All right, man. Let's do this. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Greg Charvat. I'm. Whoa, 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 whoa! I start. Oh. I start. I start. Oh, you start. Oh, I yeah. forgot. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Talk show host. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, I heard you had a difficult childhood. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs>